Hey everyone, Mike here in the BFH Garage again. Today we're doing a re-gear on a 2006 LJ. It's a Rubicon, so the nice thing about that is, is you're gonna get to see the insides of that axle, which has the factory locker in there. Now you need to be careful when you're working on these because they have to go back in a certain way in order to get that actuator pin set correctly. So we'll cover that for sure. Um, there's gonna be some other work done on this uh, Jeep as well, but today we're focusing on that re-gear. I get a lot of comments from people, a lot of emails, people asking, hey, can you do a little bit deeper re-gear video to help them understand some things? So hopefully we get that covered today. Okay, so a lot of people have been asking about a more detailed video on a re-gear job. This job is gonna be slightly different because we have a Rubicon, which has the standard Rubicon locker. The gear job itself is the same, but putting that locker in is gonna be where the difference is. So again, with any uh, re-gear video I do, I always tell everybody that I like to start with a very clean environment. I put a towel down because I use my welding table for grinding and the last thing you wanna do is get grinding dust all over your bearings and your gears. So I put a towel down and the other nice thing about that is it creates a lot of contrast. So if I'm looking for something, it's easy to see it right there on the towel because it contrasts so greatly. Um, when we set up for gears, I get my area established that I'm gonna work in. The very next thing I do is I start cleaning my parts. So I take some brake clean and I get my gear set, get all that packing oil off there because it comes with that packing oil to keep it from rusting. You wanna get all that stuff wiped off really good. And what's really important is here in the bolt holes, there's packing grease that'll sometimes get down in there. And you wanna make sure you take brake clean, put it in there, get all of that grease out. Otherwise, those uh, your ring gear bolts may not hold, even with Loctite. I've seen some videos where we've had some uh, ring gear uh, failures that somebody posted up and uh, we kind of attributed it to a dirty environment to where the Loctite couldn't truly set the way it needed to. So after I get all of the packing uh, grease off everything, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to verify that this particular ring and pinion match. So when you look here on this uh, pinion gear here, I verify that it's the Dana 44 513, which is, um, which is what we're doing for this particular rig. So 513 is the gear ratio, but this number up top here, 71, is a matching number to this ring gear. And when you look at that 71 there, and you look on the ring gear here, and you're gonna find a 71 there. That means that this ring gear was lapped with that pinion gear, and they are a paired set. If you're not familiar with setting up gears and this is your first time and you're trying to get a feel for this, understand that you cannot take a pinion gear from one axle and put it with the ring gear of another axle. It just doesn't work that way. These are machined together, they're lapped together, and they need to stay together. So make sure that's clear. As far as bearings go, when you get a um, when you get a master install kit, I always tell people, I don't care how many miles you have on your axle, it's always better to just start with new bearings. You're already in there, it's gonna make it uh, a good clean setup. You're starting with fresh everything. So when you're looking here, you have all the bearings. I'm gonna pull out another master install kit here just for reference. So these master install kits come um, sealed like that. Everything is good. This here's for the front because you have the seals here, but you have to pull all of this stuff out. And when they vacuum seal this stuff, you gotta be careful when you cut around this stuff, you go to start pulling these out. If you don't have it cut out exactly right, there's a chance you could bend your shims and you don't wanna do that. The bearings also come vacuum sealed like that and all that keeps them from rusting and it keeps all the parts together and it makes sure that you're getting a consistent uh, master install kit all the time. Now here in the BFH garage, you guys know my opinion on gears. There's a ton of them out there. You have Yukon, you have Motive, um, there's a bunch. You know I prefer to use Revolution gears. They set up uh, very easy and they run really quiet and they run cool. So talking about some of the specialized tools that you need for a re-gear. You have a dial indicator here. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail right now on how it's used, but you're gonna need one of these. And you know what? This one's from Harbor Freight. Um, it's pretty uh, foolproof. It's not as nice as some of the other ones out there, and I will get another one eventually, but this gets the job done. You're gonna need a beam style torque wrench in order to check your pinion bearings uh, preload. 
and that's really important that you have a beam style or you could have a um, dial indicator, or not a dial indicator, but a, uh, a dial style um, uh, inch pound torque wrench, but you cannot use a clicker style. The problem with clicker styles is that you can get to the torque, but you need to measure rotational. So once you get to that force, you need to be able to rotate this. So this will go on your pinion and you're rotating this. And while you're rotating it, you're reading where it's at. So a clicker style will not work under any circumstance for this. So you're gonna need a beam style. I bought this, oh, probably 15 years ago and it was like 40 bucks. So I don't know where they're at now in 2021's uh, a year. Next thing you need is a micrometer. You're gonna need this to measure shim thicknesses. And if you're looking at this video to set up gears, you're gonna understand that shim thickness is what this game is all about. You have to get a certain number of shims on one side to the other to get everything matched up. We'll go into detail on that once we start setting up the gears themselves. Um, they send you some paste with a, with a brush that will uh, be used to check the pattern. They send, I already threw it away, hold on. They send, or they, they put in the, uh, and this is every single company that I've ever gotten gears from. Of course, it fell out of this bag. They send their generic brand version of, of Loctite, and it's actually Permatex. I've not had uh, any luck with these. These are not that great. This here is a blue Loctite. When you're doing ring gears, you want to use a red Loctite. And that red Loctite means that, uh, typically means that it takes heat to get it to come loose. And on a ring gear, if you have a good, strong uh, impact wrench, then you won't have to use heat but this will help to keep the ring gear bolts into the ring gear and not come apart and have any type of catastrophic failure. So I always prefer to use a Loctite brand to make sure that uh, my ring gear bolts are set up correctly. Other things in there, you're gonna have a, uh, a new pinion seal and you're also gonna have a new pinion nut. Sometimes these nuts come with uh, a separate nut, separate washer. I like Revolution, they add these in here. That's the, the everything and it's got your nut with, I don't even know what these things are called, but it's got the uh, washer kind of built right into that. Um, one word of advice when you uh, go to set up your gears, this nut will be going on the backside of your pinion gear multiple times as you make adjustments. So the one thing I don't wanna do is use the, the new nut over and over and over because it's gonna um, cause it to gall the threads and it will also lose its holding property. When you look at uh, this nut here, I don't know if you get a close-up on that, you're gonna see how it's kind of an oval shape and that there is designed that way. You see the crimps on the top there on three different sides. Those crimps are, are put in this nut. It's a Stover type nut. I forget what the action, it's a locking nut, but Stover's a brand. But anyway, this, um, this nut's designed to go on once and the threads are pretty sharp and it catches those threads and it locks down and it stays in place. You don't have to worry about it backing off. So. Do not use your new nut until you're ready for final assembly. Um, I have a, uh, what I call as a setup nut on mine. And what I do is I take and I uh, have a Dremel and I ground down the threads a little bit so that way they're not cutting into the pinion gear. And I do it just enough that it goes on and off fairly easily but without damaging the threads on your pinion gear. So that's it for um, parts and pieces to this puzzle. Um, we'll get inside that axle housing and I'll explain a little bit more as we go along. Okay, so we have the Jeep up on the lift and I understand that you may be doing this in your driveway and I'm here to tell you that I used to do this in my driveway and I would prefer to pull the axle out and put it up on a workbench to set gears rather than do it while it's still underneath the Jeep. But I got a lift because my back got tired and now I can do it this way. So. If you're doing it in your driveway, I just want you to understand, I empathize with you, I understand it's a lot more difficult when you're doing that, but for purpose of this, it makes it way easier for me and uh, we get better video footage and everything for it because it's up on this lift. So that's my disclaimer with that, been there, done that. So to, first thing we do when we start to uh, prep this gear is the first thing I always do is I get the diff cover up and let the oil start dripping before I start pulling axle shafts out or anything like that because it gives time for this stuff to settle down and come back down to that drip pan. And then when I come back in to clean it up, there's not that much in there. So the first uh, first thing we're gonna do, get the diff cover off, get that oil starting to drain, and then we'll get the axle shafts, the brakes, and uh, I believe that'd be it. Get all that stuff out of the way and we'll get busy.
with the brakes and the axle shafts out, now it's time to get in there and get that locker clean. So when you look at what you have here, if you're working in your uh, driveway or something like that and you're not taking the axle out, the one thing you need to be careful of, gravity is working against you. Right now this pinion's pointed up and this locker could come sliding out. So before you take those bolts out, be ready to catch this thing because if it doesn't have enough preload on there, then it could fall out and damage your locker. Um, on a Rubicon version, the, the locker here, the factory locker, at least on a TJ here, the uh, JKs and JLs will be a little bit different, but we have to remove this airline here first before we do that. And there's a little spring clip here. And if you could see here, this one's actually spinning in place. So um, when I put this back together, I'll probably wire tight to make sure that this doesn't come off. I've seen that happen on multiple occasions where somebody had their factory locker but the airline popped right off because the spring clamp here just wasn't uh, holding force just because it got old. Now, one thing I noticed in this uh, housing right away that kind of surprised me, this is a completely factory setup. The only thing that's been done is a uh, gear oil change on it one time. But if you look right here, you're gonna see this shim. This is the factory master shim and it's already popped out next to the bearing cap here. That's not normal, so this is only a, a matter of time before this thing was uh, uh, going to fail. So glad we caught that, glad we saw that, but um, we'll get that fixed up when we put everything back together. Now, when you go to take this apart, um, you pull these bearing caps off. Understand that they are, and I say this in every video, so play along here, the bearing caps have to go back on the same side and the same orientation. When you're dealing with a factory locker, uh, such as the Rubicon here, that's pretty easy because you have the notch already cut out in this bearing cap here, so you know where this one comes. You come over to this other side here, and when you look right here, actually come around this other side, I'm gonna see if this light can get there. Let me get my flashlight. So the other side, you're gonna notice there's an X stamped into the housing right here. And when you look at the bearing cap, we're looking for another X that will match that. And uh, I don't even, I don't even see one in there. So if you see an X here, normally there's an X stamped in here and I don't see it on here. So when I get these bearing caps out, I'm gonna take a closer look. In the meantime though, I'm gonna put a punch mark here and I'm gonna put a punch mark up on the top of the bearing cap there so I know which way it goes back in. And then I'm gonna see if that X is there. Now on a normal uh, axle housing where you see this X sideways, on the other side over here, there would be another one that would be upright. Well, because this is a factory locker and it has the notch, they don't need to do that because it obviously only goes in one way. So we're gonna get this stuff out next and take a look at that inside. You remember at the beginning of the video, I talked about how when you pull the locker out, it comes out um, straight, but when you go to put it back in, don't forget it has a factory locker. There's a plunger back in there. So I wanna make sure I explain that once I get this out of here. In the meantime, we have your airline here, which has this little spring clamp. And you can see this thing just pulls right off. Um, we'll get it up and off of that nipple. And then we need to get this airline up. Now the downside, to some of these Rubicon lockers, these airlines become brittle and they can break uh, pretty easily. So we wanna make sure that we um, take care when we remove this off of that nipple. So when you go to remove it, be sure uh, to be careful. I wanna make sure I don't get my head in there. So I'm gonna come down low, because I remember my last re-gear video, you guys saw the back of my head, I'm sure you did like that. So you gotta push up from the bottom side, and eventually it slides right off. Be careful if you're pushing very hard and this isn't moving, you don't wanna bend the nipple either. So Pay attention to when you're doing that and get that thing off of there. I'm gonna leave the spring clamp on there for now and uh, we'll come back to that. Next, we have the bearing cap bolts. So I took the bearing cap off, I forgot to mark it, so I'm gonna mark that real quick first. You don't have to hammer these in there, but you definitely want to get something that identifies which one goes where. I already put a mark on the bearing cap, so that's already done. Now, if you take a closer look here, I haven't moved this at all, 
And if you look at this shim here, if you come out from this side right here, you see how that shim's already starting to um, fall out just a little bit. And that's from a factory setup right there. You see the gap right back inside there. Um, that's no bueno. So good thing we're resetting these gears. So now I have all the ring gear bolt, I'm sorry, not ring gear, I have all of the um, bearing cap bolts out with the exception of this one. And I want to put my hand here to hold it just in case this thing comes falling out because I don't want to have the locker go slam into the ground. So because this is a Rubicon factory locker, it has all of the actuator plates and everything there that you got to kind of work around. So let's see where the preload's at. See, I can pull that out by hand. A properly set up gear. Not saying Dana didn't set this up right from the factory because back then it was probably right. But you see how easy that thing can pop out and fall to the ground. So I was able to catch it. I'll pull it out, set it down here with the rest of this stuff. And then we'll take a look at uh, the insides. Um, one thing too, before I forget, if you're pulling stuff apart, make sure you remember how this stuff goes. This one goes to the top bolt there. The bottom one just has a washer. But think about that before you pull everything off and have everything fall apart, and then you don't know what went where. The other thing that's really important, shims um, go side to side. Even, even though we're resetting um, gears here, that's not going to be as critically important. But if you were just pulling this out to... I don't know, for whatever reason, you're pulling your locker out. This could be your front locker and you're just changing out inner seals. You wanna make sure when you go to put it back together, you put your shims in on the same side that they came out of. Since we're doing a re-gear, it's not as critical, but I'm still gonna keep them side to side so I have a good starting point. What a friggin' mess. I have a locker out of the housing there, and one thing I want to make sure I do before I forget is the ring gear, when it fits over a locker or a carrier, it is really, really tight. You can't just set it on there and tighten it down. So in order to get it to slide on there easy, easier, I'll take the ring gear and I'll put it in the oven at 220 degrees, 225 degrees for about 30 minutes. And what it does, that metal expands just enough that it'll slide right over the carrier or the locker, depending on what you have. And then you can tighten it down and everything's fine. One thing you don't want to do is take your ring gear, put it over your carrier, and then start pounding on it with a hammer to get it to fit. The other thing you don't want to do is put your ring gear on there and use the actual ring gear bolts to pull it on the rest of the way. That's a no-no because these bolts stretch. They're designed for one-time use and you don't want to take a chance on having your ring gear not seat correctly. Before I go put this in the oven, one last thing about it is, and it's, it's probably more so with older gears than newer gears, you wanna make sure this backside mating surface is completely flat. So you could take a, uh, there's a stone you can use, and I have one over there I'll get in a minute, but you just wanna rub it over, make sure if there's any burrs or anything on that ring gear, that you're getting that stuff off so that ring gear sits nice and flat. So I'm gonna go get this in the oven. We're gonna come back out. I'm gonna take that pinion gear out and uh, we'll get the inside of that uh, housing cleaned up. With the locker out of the housing, we now need to get the pinion gear out of there and that's held on the other side with the pinion nut. You have the yoke that squishes it. And the best way to get that off, in my opinion, is a nice impact wrench. You can use a pipe wrench and a cheater bar. Um, if you're working on your driveway, it's a pain in the butt to get enough leverage with the cheater bar, but it could be done. But I always use an impact wrench just because it makes it easier. Make short work of it. So to get the pinion gear out, it, the, the gear itself is uh, held in by a bearing on the inside. So there's an interference bearing there that you have to kind of punch this pinion out that way to get it to come loose. So I take a, a nut and I put it back on with just a couple threads. And I take a center punch and there's a little indentation at the end of your pinion there. And you just punch it until it comes loose. And you see how it comes loose. 
Then I put my hand around to make sure it doesn't fall out. But since we're not reusing these gears, I'm not too concerned. But still. Um, and you may have to tap it the rest of the way. Just so we're clear, if that was a new gear, I would not use this hammer. I'd use my dead blow mallet. And out comes your pinion gear. One thing I want to make sure I keep track of are these shims right here because that's what sets my preload for this inner bearing here, your tail bearing. So I'll keep those on there, I'll measure them out, and that'll be a good starting point for me. With the pinion out the other side, we have a seal here that we need to get out before we can pull this bearing out. So you get a seal puller, you can use a screwdriver, a bunch of different things you can do. You just want to tear this thing out and get it pulled out however you got to do it. And it sometimes isn't pretty. You can see how this one's kind of corroded, rusted on, so I'm probably going to have to get a screwdriver in there to try to get that. So obviously that other seal puller um, wasn't going to work for me. So now the other way to do this, you got to start peeling this lip back. You can use a flathead screwdriver and a hammer and you're eventually going to work it back little by little until it collapses on itself. And these uh, take a little bit of time. Like I said, this one here is uh, a little bit corroded, so it's a little bit uglier than the others, but let's see. So if you peel this seal up here, or the lip I should say, and you get a good start, you see I got a bulge right there. You wanna make sure you don't damage the inside of this, but what you can do is when you get that started, kind of bend at an angle, start putting it up there, and then you can pry it, pry it out, just like that. So you can see that this pinion seal is just very rusted. It's a pain in the butt to come out. I'm not gonna keep digging in there to damage that. I'm gonna take the easy boat out that I normally take. I was just showing you how to get this done in case all you need to do is change a uh, pinion seal. But since we're doing a full gear job, I'm just gonna take it off on the back side. So I have the seal out from the other side. I have the pinion bearing out, the, the tail bearing, and I also at the same time got that other race out. So you have to understand there's two races in here that squish together these bearings. The one on the outside is out, now I need to take out the one from the inside. And the way you do this, come back here to the back side, let me show you real quick. So if you look down in there, you're gonna see the, the bearing and you can just have that little bit of a lip. So you wanna get a, uh, some sort of punch or object that can catch just the edge of that lip there, and then come to this side, then go up here, then go down there. You wanna kind of work in a circular motion and eventually that race will pop out. Before we take the old ring gear off and put the new one on, we need to get these bearings off and get the new bearings pressed on. When you look at the pinion gear, you're going to notice right between there, let me see if I have something like a point to it, right between there, there's that shim right there. So that thin piece of metal, that's a shim that helps to set pinion depth. So we want to pull this bearing off, I want to measure that shim to see what it is, that will be my starting point for um, my pinion depth. Now, I've already pulled off the other shims, cleaned those up, and as you'll see here, 68 was my starting depth for my pinion preload. And when I go to put the final assembly back together, I'm gonna start off with 68 and make sure that my preload is set appropriately. In this case here, it's gonna be 16 to 20 inch pounds. 
And if uh, 68 is the magic number, then I'm gonna be real happy with that. So with the locker out, I'm getting things cleaned up, getting my shims marked as I stated earlier. One thing I wanna point out before you guys do this, and I almost completely forgot about it. Do you remember when I beat the seal out from the other side? The downside of that is you're gonna damage your inner baffle there. So before you go off and use that technique, make sure you have a replacement baffle and that goes right behind the seal once it's installed. So don't go beating on that thing unless you're sure you have a replacement baffle. Um, next, we're gonna cut the bearings off. It's the easiest way to get them off. Right in between here, if you look closely, right between this bearing, you're gonna see a really thin shim there. And that shim is what sets the pinion up from the factory. So when you uh, think of Dana Spicer at their factory building axles, they have a whole you know, wall full of these shims, I guess, and they measure what the pinion depth is, they go pick the right shim and they do that. They don't have to stack up multiple shims like us amateurs do. So I'm gonna pull this shim out, I'm gonna measure it. We're not reusing bearings, so I'm gonna cut those off. And then uh, on this one here, the bearing, I'm sorry, the shims on a factory locker go to the outside. So we'll get the bearings pressed on first, then we'll worry about getting uh, shims all set up. So next, we're cutting these off. So when, we, when I uh, cut this off of the cutting wheel, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of the cage and the bearings. Then we have to take off the actual um, cone part of it. You don't wanna cut into the journal there. So you wanna make a slice that's gonna be deep enough, but not too deep. And sometimes that takes experience, but what I suggest is get it deep, try to pop it off with your chisel. If that doesn't work, take it a little bit deeper, but you don't wanna cut into the journal. You can cause damage that may make the bearing not wanna stay on when you press your new one on. So first thing again, we're taking off the cage and the bearings. Now, as you get a close up here, you got to be careful because this thing kind of, it goes on straight on the journal, but the back side of the bearing cone is thicker than the front side. So I always work the front side and kind of work it towards the back because the, the back will never be as deep as the front because you'll start digging into something else. So you just take your time. You got to be careful when you do this. Take your time when you get that groove across put a cold chisel in there, pop it off if you can. If it's not gonna go, then just slowly, slowly, slowly keep working it. So come over here, take a look at this groove. Once you get that groove that deep, then take a chisel. Usually I use a bigger one than this, but I can't find my other one right now. You put it right inside that groove and where I do it, I kind of work one side and hopefully it splits going the other way. So I put it towards this side here you pop it, and if it breaks, normally it'll pinch your chisel and you could pull it right off. Sometimes it doesn't, and you'll have to work it off. But in this case here, I've already popped it and it has uh, released. So I'm gonna try to be careful here and show you. So if I come here, and you pop it there. And sometimes it takes a pretty good pop. So that one's gonna be a pain in the butt to get off. So I gotta take a screwdriver coming here. I have to get a bigger one. Well, actually, let me get it up here. You take a screwdriver coming here, turn it, and it'll come off. So you just gotta work it like that. Once you get your bearings off, make sure you come back and you clean it up. Get some brake clean in there, spray all that grinding dust away. The last thing you wanna do is have grinding dust get in behind anything and start causing premature wear. So the the bladder thing that, that your five PSI inflates to engage your lockers right there, you don't wanna get a bunch of grit and everything behind there either, nor do you want it on the bearing journal. So give everything a good spray down, wipe it all down and um, get all that stuff out of there. So next we'll get the ring gear off of there. Getting the ring gear off, like I said, these are normally red Loctite. Get yourself an impact wrench. These come right out.
If anybody's wondering, I love this thing. Now to get the ring gear off, you can just take a punch. Straight on through. Okay, so the ring gear is out of the oven. It's pretty hot right now. I'm gonna let it cool down just a little bit before I start handling it. Um, one thing I wanna point out, before you press your bearings onto your locker, make sure that you put your actuator back over the top before you press that bearing on, because once you press that bearing on, if you don't have this in place, you're gonna have to uh, find a way to get that bearing off or get a new bearing to uh, take the place of that. So this goes on first. When we get the ring gear on there, you'll see that it fits right over the top. Without that being preheated, there would be a gap between the flange and the ring gear there, and, and it's just a pain in the rear to get that to settle down. So by heating it up, it allows it, it, allows it to come over the top of this flange and settle down uh, where it needs to. Now, by heating it, if, if you see there's just a little bit of movement right there and I'll let it cool down just a little bit before I decide to uh, put the ring gear bolts in and tighten it down. That'll allow it to get to a, a perfect uh, fit for me. So before I get the ring gear set on there, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take Loctite and I'm gonna put a generous amount on there, not overdo it, but a generous amount about like that right there on each bolt. And that'll help to hold it in place once it's uh, the ring gear is in place and that'll keep those bolts from backing out and cause any damage down the road So on these gears here, you're gonna see how they're dual drilled They can allow for two different size ring gear bolts. Just line up your ring gear bolts with the hole that goes with Sometimes if you have an ARB or a different kind of locker the ring gear bolt holes will be different size and they allow to match that up So I'm gonna take this locker set it over the top Pull my ring gear up to it, get that in place, make sure I got the right bolt holes lined up. And I'm gonna start, ooh, that's still hot. I'm gonna start a bolt on this side just to hold it in place. I'm gonna start a bolt over here on this side just to hold it in place. And then I'm gonna get them uh, drilled on. Again, I have the drill with the clutch. And that keeps from over tightening and also from that thing spinning in my hand. So those are set there now. What I'll do is I'll take the rest of the ring gear bolts, get them started. And work in a crisscross fashion. This drill's not really putting any torque on it, but it's still good practice. So they're all set there now. One of the things I do that a lot of people don't do is I will put numbers on each ring gear bolt to make sure that I'm getting a good crisscross pattern for when I torque this down. Okay, we got the ring gear bolts tightened down the spec. As you see, I wrote down numbers on top to make sure I get a good crisscross pattern. On this Dana 44, which is a 2006, the ring gear uh, torque spec is 100 foot pounds. Now I need to get my bearings on. I want to make sure I don't forget this actuator, but I'm going to put that on a second. I'm going to do the backside first. I'm going to put that on there, and then we're going to have some old cones cut off from other uh, bearings. And I use that as my press to get these on, so that way I don't damage the bearing. So I need to uh, readjust my press real quick. Be right back. Okay, so I have the, the bearing on there. The thing is, you want to make sure it goes on straight. So I take an old race. I put it upside down, and that way it matches up with the old one. And while I'm pressing, I'll spin this to make sure that I'm not crushing my bearings. Now, for the top side up here, I use an old three-quarter inch piece of a um, chunk of steel I just had laying around, and that will be my press point. So I'm going to get this kind of leveled out a little bit. And I can tell already that's off just a little bit. And this is where you really want to take it slow because if you don't, you could have some problems. So I'll make sure that bearing is right where it needs to be. Make sure it spins. 
and you're gonna start pressing. Now, before you start pressing, make sure you have your cone oriented the right way. You want your slant going away from the ring gear. So looking at it, everything looks good. I'm gonna start pressing on. You see the bearings dropping on, that still spins. That tells me we're good there. Still spins, so I'm not putting any pressure on the bearing. And you'll know when it seats home, you'll just feel it right there. So you, you heard it, you felt it, that comes off now. Now we'll get to the other side. All right, so we're ready to press on the other side now. You wanna make sure that the journal on the bottom side sticks out further than the bearing, because you don't wanna crush that bearing, and this one does, so that's not a big deal. Take some uh, bearing grease, you can line the inside of the bearing. If you want people to make comments about that, that's fine. You do that and that'll keep it from corroding and getting stuck on there. Um, again, same thing, I just put on my old uh, cone, put in my little block there, and I'm gonna just start pressing this one on too. So you wanna make sure everything's lined up straight before you start driving that thing home. And the other thing you wanna make sure, don't forget to put this thing back on there, you're not gonna like yourself. You see how that just it got right over the top side? And there she goes, bearing's free, so we're not doing any damage to the bearing whatsoever. All right, so I have the ring gear on. It's torqued down to spec, I have the bearings on. So if you imagine this locker being inside the axle right now, the, the whole purpose of setting gears, and I've demonstrated this in other videos as well, it is a, I guess a symphony, I don't know if I like that word or not, but anyway, the whole point is we're trying to get the ring gear to mesh with the pinion gear um, perfectly. And so it can't be too deep, it can't be too shallow, you want it to, to mesh perfectly. So when you talk about pinion depth, it's either out or it's in. So that could be too deep, this could be too shallow. So out and in this way, and then when you think about ring gear, um, when you hear of the uh, term preload on your carrier bearings, that's going to be how far away your ring gear is from your pinion gear. So you see how this moves in and out. And this is very, very exaggerated. You know, when this gets done, it'll be done in thousands of an inch. But the, the thing you're trying to do is find that perfect sweet spot of the ring gear close enough to the pinion and the pinion deep enough that it meshes perfectly on the ring gear. So it's a combination of this and this in order to find that sweet spot. And if you look at my other videos, you'll see where I demonstrated that as well. So the way we accomplish this, when you look at your carrier bearings, you have your race, goes on each side of the bearing there. And on the outside of those bearing go these shims. The shims based on the thickness move this ring gear, the entire locker, either this way or this way, depending on what you do. So I'm gonna set this sideways just so I don't drop it. Imagine if you will, you have shims on both sides, but the ring gear is just too far away from the pinion. The way you're going to get that ring gear to move towards the pinion is you're going to take away shims on this side and add them back to this side. So everything gets pushed over and it moves your ring gear over. You need to move the ring gear away, it's gonna be exactly the opposite. You're gonna take shims from this side, put them on this side, and it's gonna move everything that way. Now from the factory, the factory uses um, OEM factory shims. These both measured out at 127s, which I've never seen them identical like that, so that's uh, kind of interesting of itself. So if this doesn't line up right, then I have a box of other shims that I'm gonna to have to kind of mix and match to make this work, but if, if the gears don't set up correctly using these two master shims, then I'm going to have to discard one of these shims and uh, put in a, a stack of shims. So you see here I have a whole stack of shims. I'm gonna have to make my own exact depth, not depth, my own exact width of shim. This sounds very confusing. In fact, I'm starting to confuse myself a little bit. So you'll understand uh, better once I start putting it in there. Now, as far as the pinion gear, this uh, pinion bearing is gonna go over the top there. What used to be there is this shim here. So the way they set pinion depth was this shim would get put there. 
this bearing go over the top, they press it on, they're done because they have a tool that measures the correct pinion depth. We are amateurs, we can't do that. So I'm just gonna press this bearing on right now. I don't ever need to take it back off. And the way we're going to accomplish pinion depth is by taking these shims here and putting them behind this race. Now, this race gets uh, pressed in, you know, use a hammer and a, and a bearing race press to get this in, but I have a, a setup race that I use for setups. So I strongly encourage you to do that. In fact, I encourage you to use a brand new bearing of the same brand that you're gonna be using and you, um, you slowly take off the outside of this bearing until it fits inside the housing to where you could pull it in and out with your fingers. And what that allows you to do, it allows you to pull the pinion in and out several times until you can get your, your depth correct. Um, that's all there is to it. It's not too hard. So bearings pressed on, the bearings pressed onto the pinion. For the inner bearing of the pinion, I'm using a setup pinion or setup uh, race. So that'll get that'll slide right inside the housing. I'll show you that in a minute. However, the tail bearing goes on this way, and here's the tail bearing here. So this race goes on this way, and then this bearing will go over the top. And when you think about preload, think about this bearing and this bearing, and we're squishing things together to a certain um, foot pounds in order to get our our preload. So this has to go in and out several times. This bearing here is not technically a press bearing, it's an interference fit, meaning that when I tighten the yoke down, it'll press this thing on, and then when I use the punch, it'll take this back off. It's not like I have to cut it back off like I did the other bearings. Now, the one thing is, I don't need to take this race in and out each time, so I'm just gonna go ahead and put this one in, get it installed, and forget it. This one here is gonna come in and out multiple times while I determine what our pinion depth is. When that's done, this one comes off and the brand new one will have to be set using a driver. So let's go get these things put inside the housing. So you remember when I cleaned out the, or pulled out the seal here, it had a lot of junk in there. So I get all that stuff off of there before I set any uh, bearing races. Took some really fine grit sandpaper, kind of cleaned it up a little bit to get all those uh, sharp edges off so we're not destroying the new seal. And then next up is I want to take a rag and I'm going to wipe all those interior surfaces down to make sure that it is as clean as possible. You don't want anything in between your race and that housing or that's going to throw off everything. And I've had that happen before and I've learned to set up gears and it's not pleasant because you chase your tail all day long. To set these, get them in, Let's take your race, make sure it's oriented the right way. Set it in there as straight as you can get it. Take your driver, get it set, and you just slowly start tapping it until it starts to set. And that one's already starting to set, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just start pounding it in. And you'll know when it's set because you hear that dull thud or a ping, you'll, you'll tell because there's a resistance on your driver. The factory pinion depth that was in there uh, when I pulled this out was set at 57, so that's what I'm going to start with. Everybody always gets confused about the numbers on the head of the pinion gear of, hey, I need to add, subtract, to make sure I can get to where I need to be. It doesn't matter. Take out what was in there, measure it, and use that as a starting point. You're gonna be pretty close. In this case here was 57. I have my setup race. That's gonna slide right in just like that. So before we go any further, I want to go ahead and cover that sensor that we need to uh, talk about prior to reinstallation of the locker. Now you only need to do this upon final assembly. You don't have to do it every single time. But when you go to put it back together for the final time, you definitely need to do that. So if you come up here and take a look, you see this plunger here. This plunger comes out this way. And when you reinstall the locker, you need to have space between that plunger so the locker mechanism can get over the top of that. And the way we do that is we create a little um, device that will sit up there and I'll, I'll shine the light here in just a second. Let me get it set real quick first. It's real hard with the camera in my way. So 
So what you do is you get a stick, a toothpick, anything like that, and what it does, that pulls that plunger out, and it should be up a little bit higher than what it is. But once you get your locker in there, then you simply take and pull this, and then this plunger comes back to where it needs to be. So it needs to be out this way before you reinstall your locker. So find yourself a little toothpick, a toothpick or something else, make on your own like I did there, set it up top, have the wire come out, and once you get that locker installed for the final time, then you want to pull that out. I have the race in there, I have the shims behind it, so now I have to get the pinion gear in there. If you don't hold this thing, it's gonna slide out, land on the ground, we don't want that, so make sure that you have a way to keep this in your hand. Now understand when you're setting up gears and if this is your first time, you don't want to install the seal yet. You don't want to put that baffle in there. You don't need any of that until you're ready for final assembly. So the way this works is I'm going to take the pinion gear, slide it up from the other side, make sure that race seats all the way in there. Here's that tail bearing I was talking about. That goes on. Then you're going to take your yoke, set your yoke over the splines. Oh, come on. What you got going on there? There it is. Take your setup nut. You remember I talked about a setup nut? Get that started. And then from here, impact. Now, one thing you want to be careful of. Uh, hang on just a second. One thing you want to be careful of is right now you have no shims in there, so it's easy to over tighten this and crush your bearing. You don't want to do that. So if you're going to use an impact wrench, take breaks after a few seconds to make sure that you're not over tightening this. So I'll spin it and kind of make sure that bearing's seated. And you see how that spins now? That one might be just a tad bit tight, but not enough that I'm worried about that. So that's set where I need it to be. And then after that, coming back around this side. So now you can see that you have your pinion installed for the purpose of trying to uh, run a pattern. So next thing up is we're gonna reinstall the locker with the factory shims and see what it looks like. One thing I wanna show you real quick in here. Um, come up here, let me show you. You see this little orange goo right here. A lot of people think that that's a seal that went bad or something like that. That's nothing more than the sealant they use when they press the tube into the actual housing. So if you see that, there's nothing to be replaced. It's okay to peel whatever's inside of there out. No harm, no foul on that. All that is is sealant from when they pressed in the tube. Now to get the locker in, I'm taking the factory shims. Make sure I get them right. There's one side that's a little more round than the other. You want that to go to the outside. And remember, you are working with gravity against you right now, so you don't want to drop this locker. And it's really awkward. It's kind of heavy. I think it weighs maybe 25, 30 pounds. And you're going to want to kind of set it up in there. And start working it in. Now with the Rubicon locker, it's paying the butt because you have to have your bearing cap on already when you go to press it in because of that actuator. So we get that kind of far in. And you know what I need? We didn't figure go grab that orange mallet. I'm gonna have all my tools together. So we gotta start pressing this thing in. I don't want to walk away from the locker and not have it get seated properly. So these, um, to get the proper amount of preload, sometimes you got to wail on these things just a little bit to get them there. And make sure you catch up your shims and everything as you do it. So as I told you before, I didn't think we had enough preload on this when we first started, so we're gonna have to kind of play around with that and see what we get. The clicking you hear right there back and forth, that's your backlash. So that's the amount of space that's between the pinion head and the ring gear. That's what we use the dial indicator to measure. So I have the locker up there. If you don't have a case spreader, which most people don't because they're about four or $500, 
case spreader fit in these two little holes right here and what they do is they separate that you set this in there and then you release it and it puts your preload on there most amateurs don't have that um, i don't have one i've set a lot of gears i use a dead blow and if it takes about six or eight good wax to get your carrier in there or your locker then you're pretty good this one felt kind of loose to me but it, it's in there tight enough that i'm going to run a pattern and see or i'm going to check back i should say and see if we are close enough to run a pattern. And if so, um, that'll kind of give us an idea of where we're at. So first thing you wanna do when you run a pattern, you wanna put your ring gear, I always call them ring gear bolts, I don't know why that is. You wanna put your bearing cap bolts back in and um, you wanna get them to finger tight because your, your backlash information could be altered if you don't. Again, I use that drill with the, with the clutch. Make sure you don't damage your ear nipple. Now that's in there tight enough. I can hear that, so now I'm gonna check backlash. Okay, so we can hear that we have backlash here. Let's check it now. So you're gonna take your dial indicator, and these things are kind of, uh, uh, it's almost like origami to get them set up the way you need them set up. So you're gonna have to play around with it, but the, the thing that you wanna make sure is you're running, you're checking your backlash on the drive side of your tooth. The drive side of your tooth is the one that's more flat, and then your co-side is the one that's angled. You want to take your backlash reading from the drive side. Now, if you have a high pinion 30 in the front, then that's going to change everything. You want to, uh, you'll have to take your indicator and put it on this side in order to get to the drive side of the tooth. Now, you want to make sure that this little uh, needle here doesn't touch this other tooth. The only thing that that in this uh, tip here should be touching, should be the tooth. Everything else should be free. Now looking at this, I need to make a slight adjustment. Reattach it. Actually come in just a little bit. Reattach it. So I have plenty of space in between this tooth. This one's right on the tooth there. Now I'm gonna check the backlash. You can zero it out if you want. You don't have to, as long as you're able to read numbers and do some simple math, you'll find out. So, the good news is I have backlash. The bad news is I'm barely at three thousandths of an inch. And the spec for this is between five and eight thousandths of an inch. So now um, I'm going to have to start figuring out some shim um, numbers on either side. So I need to add shims to this side to push the ring gear this way to increase the amount of space between the pinion head and the ring gear to increase my backlash. When I'm at three thousandths right now, that's going to take such a small amount of shims to do that, that uh, um, I bet you're going to be pretty close. So if I can find a three thousandths of an sh uh, inch shim and add it to this side, I'm not going to take anything away from this side because, as I said before, this felt a little bit loose. So I'm going to try just adding three thousandths and see what happens. All right, I show this trick in every re-gear video I do. A lot of people struggle with how to get the carrier out of there. And you can see that thing's in there pretty tight. You'll see videos of people trying to put straps around there at the pry bar to get this out. You'll see people with an actual pry bar in there trying to get this stuff out. Take a uh, open end wrench that's the same size as your ring gear bolt. And your gas tank's gonna get in the way there, that's fine. And then what you're gonna do is turn your pinion and it walks right out, just like that. And then that whole carrier locker assembly drops right out. There's no forcing it. There's no, none of the bullshit that comes with trying to get that carrier out. All right, so remember I had the original OEM shims here. So luckily I have a box full of other shims I use for gearing stuff. So make sure that you have plenty of shims when you go to do your uh, install, because if you don't have what you need, then it's gonna be very frustrating to say the least. And um, so on this one here, with the master shims there, um, it's not like you can just take away three thousandths or add six thousandths. You have to go to a whole new shim stack. So on this one here, I dropped four thousandths of an inch off of this side, but because my preload wasn't where I thought it should be when we pulled this out, I added 10 thousandths to this side. I want to tighten up the preload. And believe me, getting this thing in here 
was a pain in the butt, but at least I got it in there now. So now that I have that bearing cap tightened down, you can hear that we have some uh, backlash here, which is good. So now I'm gonna get back in here and recheck. I'm gonna check where our backlash is sitting. So I want it out on the edge so it's not touching that other tooth. Make sure I got my gap through there. So right now it's sitting right about five, or I'm sorry, two, and it goes up to nine. So we're sitting right about seven thousandths of an inch backlash. That is within spec. Um, so we can run a pattern now to check the pinion depth. Now understand, you do not run a pattern until you get your backlash set within spec. I don't care if you're three thousandths of a, a backlash, don't even bother running a pattern unless you get it in spec. And on this Dana 44, spec is five to eight thousandths. Right now I'm sitting at seven, which is right in the middle of the road, which is perfect. So we're gonna paint three teeth up, we're gonna run it and see what it looks like. All right, so no, when you get your, um, your master install kit, this is all the grease you get right here. This stuff comes out of here really thick. So my suggestion is to thin it out with some gyro. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So when you get ready to set your paint up, look at how thick that stuff is. I can turn it upside down, it's not gonna go anywhere. Take some gyro, put a few drops in there. You don't have to get a measuring stick out or anything like that, but then take it, start mixing up with that gyro, it thins it out. And what it does, it gives you a better pattern when you run your gears. So get it mixed up real good. And that still even seems like it's a little bit thick. And I put a ton of that in there, so this GM stuff is uber thick. There we go, that feels better right there. Now it's getting real thin and that's what I want. So I'll mix this up a little bit and then I'll show you how to paint the gears. Okay, so when you go to paint your gears, you don't have to paint every tooth because you'll run out of paint in a hurry. So paint three teeth, maybe four, front and back. And I'm still using the same paint I started with. That's how far this stuff goes. So, you know what, I'll add a fourth just because I already got most of that one. I'll paint the back of that one just to show you guys a little bit. So make sure it's covered all the way to top land and um, you will get a good pattern out of that. All right, so when you run your pattern, you want to turn your pinion until the paint goes through your pinion gear several times. Now, in order to get a good pattern, you wanna put some resistance on the ring gear so it really grabs into that pinion gear, they mesh really well, and you get a really good pattern. So to do that, I use a glove. Most of the time I just hold it up, but I'll put it on this time. And then I use a drill, that same drill I was talking about, and I'll put it on low speed and I'll use that to turn the pinion. Then I'll have to sit there and muscle everything it does it for me. Okay, it's going up, all right. So let it go through three or four times. Reverse your drill. Put that pressure on there. And with that pressure on there, it's gonna paint a pattern for us just like that. So you see now how clear that pattern is and it's easily readable. There's times you look at people looking for information on a pattern on the, on the uh, interwebs and you can't even tell where the pattern starts and the paint ends, it's just a big mess. So looking at this, wow, we're pretty close again. And you know why that is? because we started off with, with what was in there to begin with. That gives us a good idea of where we're at. Come back around this side. You see how you have that, let me get a little pick here, hang on. So look at this pattern. You see how you have that little thin line right at the top? That is good. This pattern is mostly centered in the tooth. That is good. Looking at the coast side, you're kind of in the light there. You're gonna have to scoot over this way. Looking at the coast side, this pattern is centered. You have a thin line at the top right there. That is almost perfect, but not quite. So my pinion depth is all but perfect. I'm going to put it just a little bit deeper. I look at this and I think it could possibly be shallow, although this is a runnable pattern. 
I'm gonna add just a little bit, try to put it deeper and see what happens if it makes it better or worse. If it makes it worse, I'll come right back to what we have before. Now understand, when you change your pinion depth, if I'm going to add, uh, say, one or two thousandths or three thousandths even, it's gonna throw your backlash off and you're gonna have to change these shims out in order to match that up. It is a game of adding, subtracting on your pinion and then you have to add or subtract on your carrier as well. The carrier pulled back out, now we have to pull the pinion gear out so we can pull that setup race out and add a couple more shims. So again, we have to get this backed up. I'm gonna leave it attached though, so when I go to knock this out, that pinion doesn't fall to the ground. Make sure it's on more than a thread. And then I'm gonna secure it from this side while I get the pinion nut off the rest of the way. Get this bearing off. Sit on something clean. Pinion comes out, set it somewhere safe. Now we gotta pull the setup race out. Get all the shims that are behind it, and we need to add a little bit of depth. Okay, so for this adjustment, I added three thousandths of an inch to the pinion depth, and I think that it's gonna make it too deep. But I wanna make sure, I don't wanna try to sneak up on it, I wanna make sure that I'm too deep. I'm a big fan of bracketing, which means that if I'm too shallow initially, then I make it too deep and then I know I have my goalpost set and I can start tying it into exactly what I need. In this case here, three thousandths is a big jump. Normally it's not, but because that pattern was right where it needed to be in my opinion, three thousandths is gonna be a pretty big jump and I should see a significant change on that. So we're gonna get uh, the pinion back in there and we're gonna have to reset backlash and then run a pattern again and see where it puts us. All right, so I added three thousandths to the pinion depth, but because I was right at seven thousandths backlash, I didn't, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, seven thousandths backlash before, I didn't change anything going into it. I thought I would put it in here and see where I'm at first, and um, we'll go from there. So I just got that reinstalled, and if you listen, we have backlash, that's good, that's always a good thing. And I always I keep setting this thing down and it gets out of whack and I gotta readjust everything, so hang on. This is part of the reason gears become frustrating because you have to redo everything. Okay, make sure that's on all the way, hang on. Okay, so right now I'm at 8 thousandths backlash, so we can run another pattern and see what that pinion depth did for us. Now, let me give you a word of wiseness here, when you go to repaint your teeth, don't add more paint. Um, I don't even know if those are original teeth or not, I think they're more back here. Use the existing paint of what you have right here and just re-smear it around. You don't want to start getting these things so painted up that it uh, becomes impossible to tell one tooth from the next. So there's enough paint on there, just smear it back around again because you don't want to run out of paint either. Make sure all those teeth that you had the first time are painted over, and then run it again. Remember, you need to put resistance on there. Turn it around, same thing. Okay. All right, so we Change shims out, we got it in there, everything seemed fine, I ran a pattern, and we got a funky looking pattern out of this thing. And I wasn't pleased with it at all, it's not this one, it's actually the one back there. And uh, something didn't seem right, so we pulled it apart, and I was worried that one of these shims was going to, my thin shims, was gonna get pressed in too far and bend behind, and in fact, that's what happened. 
So this is one of the things you really need to pay attention to when you're setting gears. If something doesn't seem right, if something just seems that it shouldn't be that way, start looking for things like this. So this shim, when I pressed it in or when I was pushing in with the uh, Diplo hammer, it got caught right behind there, the lip bent over, it never allowed the carrier to seat all the way. And if that happens, your backlash is gonna be a little bit different than it was last time, which mine was, but it really throws the pattern way off. And the pattern on this one, I was looking at it going, there's no way from the last pattern we had to this one that it should have been that way. So the shim was the problem. Now, we installed a new shim and I don't even know if you can see right here, but you can see it kind of sticking out this way a little bit. And that's because this shim is bigger than the master shim. So I want it to stay this side so it can seat all the way in, but not bend over on the back side there. So now that we are, uh, we had success putting that in, let's check our backlash again now and, and see where we're at. Let me get up there. Okay, so. We are right at eight thousandths again, and that's good. So now we can run a pattern again, and I'll feel a little bit more confident with this pattern, knowing that that shim's not jammed in there backwards. So let me get everything set up, we'll run this pattern. Let's do it again, again, hold that pressure. I added three thousandths to the pinion depth. This is the new pattern we're getting. It's definitely deeper into the tooth, which is good. I don't have a harsh line at the bottom. It's right on the edge of that. So I think that last pattern was really good. This one, you know, look in there, you kind of see that harsh line right there. That might be just a tad bit deep. I may back that out to the original pattern or even I have another shim that me get one thousandths of an inch deeper versus three thousandths. And looking at this side here, that looks pretty good. Um, I think I'm gonna back out and go back to the original pattern, I think. All right, so we have the pattern pretty close to where I want it. Um, the, the pinion depth, I know where it's gonna go and we're gonna check the pattern one more time. So I feel comfortable getting this pinion set in there getting everything all buttoned up on the back side, then I can adjust my backlash um, once we get the locker back in. The original shim stack that was in here was 68,000. So to keep from crushing the bearing, I'm gonna start with 70 thousandths on this, put it through, tighten it up, and see where that uh, rotational uh, preload is set at. So I still have the um, setup brace in there. And that's to allow me to make any changes I may need to on depth one last time, but I just want to get this pinion preload set so I don't forget it. So again, you don't have to put your seal in yet. You don't have to do anything yet other than put these shims here on the back side. The bearing goes back through. And when you collapse these together from tightening up the yoke on here, so this yoke's going to push down on top of that. And what it's going to do is these shims are going to keep these bearings from getting too close together. If there's no rotational resistance, then I know I need to take shims out. If there's too much rotational resistance, then I know I need to add more shims. So that's the gist of it. Now, when you're going to set your pinion preload, you, you know, tighten it up slowly first, just kind of like you're normally changing out shims and you just want to get it in that ballpark. But you want to feel if you have resistance. If you do, then you need to take it up to the torque spec to make sure that it's going to be the right amount of resistance. So let's see where we're at. So you can see there's no resistance on that. This impact wrench will get it to the 160 to 200. So I'm gonna take out two thousandths of an inch, go back to what the OEM uh, stack was and see what that looks like. 
All right, so we're getting dialed in for what our pinion depth should be. The original um, stack was 68. Now we're down to 62 to get this thing uh, set for our uh, correct pinion rotational force. And I'll show you what I mean by that here in just a second. So put the bearing on, get your yoke, put your nut on there. Now I do recommend that when you're tightening this down, it's okay to tighten up a little bit with your impact wrench, but you want to finish it off with a torque wrench and the and some sort of a holding device. I use a pipe wrench. Give me a second here. So I get a ballpark. Now that's pretty light right there, but I will finish it up with the torque wrench. And again, the spec for this is 160 to 200. And so I, I like to have my torque wrench set to the higher side. So I'm about 190-ish. Let me get that on there. So that's set to the correct spec. Now, to make sure that bearing is seated correctly, um, sometimes I pop on it with that, but I like to spin it with the drill first before I do anything. And that'll just make sure that it got seated all the way. So remember that beam style torque wrench I was talking about. You wanna get up here and you wanna measure the rotational force that it takes to turn this pinion. Disregard any starting um, uh, force. So if it gets up to 25 and then it pops, that doesn't matter. You just wanna get the rotational force, not the starting force. So in this case here, I'm spinning and we are right at, oh, about 11 or 12 thousandths of an inch. So we're just off a little bit. So I'm gonna take out one more thousandths of an inch which means I have to rework my shim stack because they don't make a 1,000 inch shim in these kits and I gotta make it work. So I need to take out about another one to two thousandths and that should get us exactly where we need. Okay, pattern's done. As you can see, I have a real thin line right at the top. I have a nice diffuse pattern all the way uh, around the pattern centered right there in the tooth. I'm happy with this pattern. So now we need to pull the um, locker out I need to get the pinion uh, seal installed. I'm gonna get the pinion all uh, completed. And then we're gonna come back to this side and I'm gonna show you how to do that actuator. Okay, we have everything set the way we want. I'm gonna take out the setup race and replace it with the new race that's gonna go in there. So our shim stack is where I want it. I'm gonna put that in first. Oh, come on, get in there. And then this one will not slide in by hand like the other one did because it is kind of a press fit. So get yourself a seal driver of the appropriate size. And you want to make sure you get this thing started because if you get a cockeyed, you can fix it, but it's just a pain in the butt. Like that. start to go in right you hear that difference of tone and then you want to make sure it seats the entire way and you're gonna feel it and hear it you hear that right there when it pinged that tells me it's all the way in okay so the, for the back side um, we need to get the pinion seal in we need to get that bearing and everything and so the first thing I do is I take a a little dab of red grease, put it around the pinion yoke, and that keeps it from prematurely wearing out that pinion seal. There's a little rubber O-ring that goes there. So I wanna make sure there's plenty of it there. And I also pack it pretty good onto the pinion seal here too. So when the yoke goes through, it is riding on grease. So the way this works, your bearing's gonna go in first, then your new baffle, and then your seal. So for a seal tool, since the pinion's not sticking through, you just need something that goes flat over that. I still have my, I don't know, three quarter, one inch, whatever this is. This is nice and flat. 
I'm gonna set it right over the top. Come around this other side. I'm gonna set it right over the top. Make sure it's driving in straight, which it is. And you could hear that thing set up against there. Now you gotta be careful, there's some seals that don't have this lip on here and if you use something to drive it in uh, farther then this baffle won't move around, you won't be able to get your pinion through there. So make sure your seal on this Data 44 has this lip. If it doesn't, just be careful when you get close, you don't wanna go any further than the pinion snout right there. Uh, where'd it go? Okay, so next I'm gonna take up my, my uh, pinion gear. I'm gonna fish it through here and I need to get it to catch up on that baffle. So you're gonna have to move this around a little bit. You may have to even get a little screwdriver in there. Give me just a second here, so we can make this work. There it is. Good. So that's all the way in there now. One thing I forgot to do, and I'm gonna show you here. One thing I always like to do, take uh, gear oil, put it right here, on the pinion bearing and let it start uh, getting in there, working around. So that way that bearing's not running dry when you first get it going. You gotta give time for that gear oil to get up there. So now that I have the gear oil in there, let's get this thing back through. Come on. There we go. So it comes through right there. Now I'm gonna take my yoke, push it on gently. You don't wanna tear your seal. Now to initially get this set, I'm gonna use my setup nut still. And that's just to get the pinion driven on. That way the new threads don't have to work hard to push that on and get them all jacked up as well. So. Do that and take that off. I'll put the new nut on. Some people advocate using red Loctite. I don't, I've never had these come off. Now let me tell you what, if you're gonna change out a leaky pinion seal, do not reuse these nuts. These are designed for one time use. They're like four bucks, five bucks, something like that. It's not worth the worry or the cost of repair if you don't get it set. Uh, without damaging your threads and stuff and have it back off and all of a sudden your gears all fall apart. So one time use. And then again, I'll use my impact to get it close. Spin it around, make sure they're seated correctly. Then I'm gonna swap over to my torque wrench and finish the job. You understand when you add a seal, that will add, um, that will add some pressure. So it's gonna feel like your pinion's a little bit harder to turn and that's, uh, that's okay, that's natural. So this is kind of the tough part here, because your locker is gonna be in here, you want a little bit of a, a curve to this, and it's gonna sit over the top side just like that. So when your locker goes in, you pull this out, and it'll be good to go. So I'm gonna set this like so, get in there. Just like that. I'm gonna kind of bend and take this up and around because I want it out of the way and I don't want that to accidentally fall out. And okay, we're at the end game here. And let me tell you what, this is probably the toughest part because you have everything where you need it to go in there, everything's set. But when you have to add a little shim like this one on the inside, it makes it very difficult to get this in there. Um, you already saw that I bent that first shim. So let that be um, some kind of lesson that you need to take your time and if something doesn't feel right, 
just back out right away. Don't even keep um, trying to force it or you're gonna have to bend in it again. And then if you run out of shims, you're gonna be in quite a pickle. So take your time, make sure you have plenty of preload. I already talked about that. And we gotta get this stuff up there. Okay, so before I go any further, I'm gonna make sure I move this line out of my way. And you see, I got this shim right where I want it. That's good, but I need to be very careful as I start to install this that I don't get it out of sequence here. Okay, so it's going in, starting to get stuck, and that's good. I want to hold it still. I'm going to start helping it out with this dead blow. You don't want to damage that, so be careful. And you want to barely help your shim along. So this one I have to get going up because it's a little bit on the downside. And I'm watching my little bitty shim there. I don't even know if you can see it, but I want to make sure it doesn't get pushed back like it did last time. So one of the things I did is a little trick is I'll, I'll take uh, some girl between my fingers and I put just the lightest coat I can all the way around the thin, sh the thin shim. And for some reason it tends to hold it in place. So give that a shot and slowly start working everything else in there. You don't want to be in a hurry. And if you're out of whack, pull everything back out. Make sure this didn't disengage. It's still good. And anyway, so you're just gonna continue to work it in, get that shim in there and get it set the rest of the way. Don't bend your shim. You see I have a little bit of a showing and we're gonna get it in the rest of the way. Okay, so I have the locker the rest of the way back in. I'm double checking my shims to make sure everything's good. The only shim I really had a concern about was a little bitty one I had right there. And from bending it the last time, I know where it needs to be this way looking at it and it is set exactly where I want it to be. Backlash still sounds good. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull this now. So this flange right here, that's what that plunger attaches to. So just pull your string. And now that plunger is behind this, you're good to go. So now we wanna make sure that we get this part back there. So when we put in our, our bearing cap bolt, that it secures this. So the first thing we're gonna do is take and put our airline back on. We're gonna move this up out of the way. Slide that on. I'm gonna take the spring clamp back down. Where am I? Need one of those. And slide it over that nipple uh, head to get this on. There you go. And then make sure it's on there firm. Make sure your bearing cap bolts have the washers on there. Nope, I suppose I need to put a bearing cap on there, huh? So make sure I got mine the right way, which I do there. Make sure that it evens up. You see how it sits kind of level there? That'll keep that this from getting jacked up, so. Put that where it needs to go. Torque spec on your bearing cap bolts is 80. Uh, I'm gonna go this way. We have everything reinstalled. The airline is reinstalled. I took a mirror, put it behind there to make sure that actuator pin is on the other side of this flange right here. So when you think about the way that pin comes out, 
it needs to be on the other side of this lip. So I verified that our bearing cap bolts are torqued down to 80 foot pounds. Everything else is all buttoned up. All we need to do now is put our uh, axle shafts back in, get the brakes back on, put the drive shaft back in, get everything bolted up, get some gear oil in this. Um, then she'll be ready to go down the road. So I think we're there. Let's get it finished up.